All right, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's uh, just after two o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started with our COVID updates uh, for today, May 19th. Um, we are um, going to cover a lot of different topics today, uh, have some updates related to the pandemic response. So I'll just cover what, what's going on with the cases, the hospitalizations, testing and test to treat, as well as vaccines and boosters. And then uh, I just wanted to give you some updates about baby formula shortages, because that is, um, unfortunately, it's becoming a crisis for some of our families that depend on baby formula. So we'll try to share some resources that you should know about if you um, are getting those questions. So in terms of statewide trends, um, hopefully you can see my slides here. Um, let me know if you can't, and I'll send these out after um, after this presentation. Um, but this is the uh, state data that they shared on Wednesday. Uh, this is an interesting graph because, you know, in, in prior times, uh, I don't even want to say the word surges, but in prior times, um, we usually see cases, which is the blue line, paralleled by hospitalizations, uh, or at least there's a little bit of a lag, but there's still a parallel. What's happening now is a real disconnect. Cases are going way up. Um, but hospitalizations are not trending that much um, in, in the upward direction. There might be a slight up sketch here, and I'll show some more local data uh, to let you draw your own conclusions. But there really is a disconnect right now with what's going on at the levels of the cases that we know about. And keep in mind, these are just the ones that we know about. There's a giant number of cases that we don't know about because we know people are testing at home and not reporting it. Uh, but nonetheless, even the officially reported case count is way higher than um, the hospitalizations and the ICU admissions. So to some extent, that is very, very welcome news that people are not as sick. Uh, but there's always the, the, the threat, I guess, that, you know, we are going to have um, a delayed rise in hospitalizations. But anyway, this is what's going on at the state level. I'll share some wastewater surveillance data with you. So I shared this slide last time, and this was what's happening with wastewater surveillance. You saw a big peak uh, related to the surge in Omicron cases uh, in January and early February. Uh, and then that peak kind of died out along with that surge. Um, and, and really, we've been flat all the way till the 1st of May. Well, Dr. Garibi with our uh, epidemiology division uh, updated this, this graph for us. And so I just, wanted to, I just wanted to shock you with what's going on now. So just keep in mind that as of May, we were totally flat in our wastewater surveillance. And then as of Tuesday, here's what it's done. And it doesn't even fit on the screen. Uh, let me try to take it off the screen and make it a little bit smaller for you. Sorry about that. Um, but basically our wastewater surveillance is showing a huge uptick. And we know from the best research that we have about wastewater, that this is going to be a leading indicator by seven to 10 days of what we can expect in terms of case counts. Now, again, that's a leap from wastewater to case counts, and then it's going to require another leap from case counts to hospitalizations. But I can tell you, get ready, brace yourselves, because we are going to see a lot more cases in the next seven to 10 days. That's my estimation based on what's going on with wastewater and lots of other data that's coming in from all over the state and all over the country about what's going on is that we are um, probably going to see an uptick that is, is substantial compared to where we are now. And many of you are already telling me that you're seeing a lot of cases now. So I think it's, it's to some extent happening, but this wastewater data usually leads by seven to 10 days. In terms of where we are with cases, this again, doesn't really do justice to the number of new cases that we're seeing, which is quite a lot, but it's still in the grand scheme of things, only a very small fraction of where we were back in January, which I think is a good, good reminder. Case positivity is another metric that we look at because it's another early indicator. The case positivity goes way up during surges, but then it comes right back down. And now it's climbing up again, as you can see, we're at 5.5%. Usually when we're at 10%, that, that usually indicates that we're in a surge. If you just look at the historical, where the 10% line uh, whenever you cross that threshold, it's because a surge was impending or happening. So we're on our way up. We were down in the 1% range. Now we're in the 5% case positivity range, meaning one out of every 20 patients that gets tested officially uh, comes back positive. 
Here's what's happening at the hospitals. Uh, again, we're uh, nowhere compared to where we were with January peaks. Uh, but that that nice low, low number is not staying too low. We were in the 40s just a few days ago, and now we're in the 50s. So uh, it's definitely a number to watch. I know this seems like information overload. We kind of obsess about these numbers, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if this was the last number to start going up after all these other numbers that I just shared with you started going up. Okay. This is in... in you know, this is again in the context of what's going on, which is we have a lot more social activities, uh, a lot fewer masks, um, and uh, you know, possibly a lot of people that are just testing at home and hopefully staying home if they can. But we know that those home tests are not getting reported, and so we do we do miss a lot of the data that we used to have. Let's talk about. Or are there any questions about metrics? Um, is there anything else that you want to see or have seen? Okay, great. Um, so we'll talk about test to treat. So I showed you this slide last time just as a high level overview of how the test to treat paradigm can work. Uh, and this is something that you can introduce into your healthcare facility. You know, hopefully you have some efficient mechanism to at least help your staff find treatment uh, efficiently. Uh, but you know, if not, if not just your staff, then hopefully your higher risk patients, you have some way to screen them. Uh, get them the answers that they want right away, but then also get them plugged into treatment. That's really important. Uh, and that's really another silver lining of where we are right now is, you know, if we get this piece right, this very simple diagram, then we can really help ourselves. We can definitely help prevent the next surge uh, inundating our hospitals, and we can really curb community transmission, uh, which is really automatically linking a positive result to a treatment. Uh, by doing a quick health screen and finding out who's high risk, and then basically consenting them and ordering their prescription, uh, which any prescriber can do at this point uh, for for virtually any patient. I mean, the age the age range is now, uh, you know, they've taken off the age restrictions. So the FDA says that anyone over the age of twelve can get Paxlovid, um, and so this really opens up the the availability of this medication to almost everyone. Now, if you're not able to do this yourself, and I really urge you to try to do as much of it as you can by yourself or with your staff, uh, but if you're not able to do it yourself, the state is putting together these test to treat programs through the OptumServe sites. So the first link here is the OptumServe registration site. Uh, some of us actually use this. If you remember when OptumServe first came into town, it was actually a great option to get a PCR test done very efficiently. And now that same link is going to be able to register people for testing and treatment. Uh, and, and we've got four locations here in Fresno County that are offering this. Um, depending on what the demand is, that may not be enough, which is why I really want more redundancy in our system. We're actually talking to other vendors to try to get them to come into town or to come into the county, especially into our rural areas. But that, but that model is probably still two to four weeks out. And so in the meantime, we may see a lot more demand on these OptumServe sites. And again, if, if these sites are, are, are overwhelmed, then your patients are going to come back to you or go into the emergency department expecting the same level of treatment. So that's why I think it's good to know about this. Certainly use it, you know, refer people to here, but just understand that it's a finite resource and, uh, and we'll just have to play it by ear if they can meet the demand that I think is going to happen in the next seven to 10 days. The second link is basically more information about the treatments themselves. It's a very nice summary of all of the different medications. Again, I wish that they would just put big billboards up which said, got COVID, get the pill, because that needs to be the slogan for 2022. It's not just got COVID, good luck and stay home. It should be got COVID, get the pill, because that's going to keep you out of the hospital. If you can't get the pill or don't qualify for the pill, then get the antibody infusion. Uh, which is the bevitelovimab, and we still have about a dozen locations in town that are offering that. So that that needs to be the new paradigm. Is this is this is now treatable? We have really good kick-ass medications that have been proven in randomized controlled trials to get people uh, to stay out of the hospitals, and we need to start using them. And if we don't use them, and if patients don't know about them, then they're only going to come see us whenever they have their bilateral pneumonia, and we know how tragic that that can be. 
And so we, we need to do whatever we can to just find these people as upstream as possible, hopefully prevent with vaccinations and boosters. But aside from that conversation, we really need to let people know that as soon as they get a test that's positive, that they can qualify for a medication that can keep them healthy. And, and many of you have, have shared stories with me about these medications working in your own life or with people that you know. So we, we have a lot of personal anecdotes that people are using them, they're getting better, they're staying out of the hospital, even our higher risk patients. And that's great. I think that that's really um, a, a cause for, if not celebration, then certainly reassurance that we're in a good place, but we do need everyone to, to be aware of this and to try to help out with whatever they can in terms of ensuring patients have access to prescribers, ensuring that prescribers know what they're talking about whenever they consent these patients. Remember that the Paxlovid does have some drug-drug interactions, but you know they, they have like a long list of medications that's very daunting. For the most part, most of those drug-drug interactions are, are just, they're going to be pretty, um, uh, they're, they're, they're going to be pretty minimal. Um, and I think you'll be able to walk through your patient's med list very quickly and figure out if there's drugs that they need to stop for five days or if there's, um, if there's anything else that they need to do to adjust their, um, you know, adjust their risk of having a drug-drug interaction. Remember, poison control can help you. You know, toxicologists like myself are, are, are very adept at working through these pharmacological interventions. Uh, just call poison control. There's a lot of other resources online. Uh, call us at Public Health. There's a lot of uh, resources to help you work through the drug-drug interaction piece of it. Don't let that be a barrier to getting these patients their medications. Um, uh, just, just keep that in mind. Any questions about that? The best case scenario, and I've told the state this in all caps letters, um, is basically we need to have a mail order system. And, and really, as soon as a patient is positive with a home test, they should be able to just click in some basic information and then get qualified over the mail to be mailed these medications. Uh, and that would really streamline a lot of this because we know patients have transportation issues. It's hard to get in and make an appointment on an emergency basis. It's hard to get and shuttle them to a pharmacy that actually had these medications. I get, I get the logistical challenges of doing it this way. And I really hope that the state will explore mail order options for these medications. Uh, I think that they're going to try to work on it. That's what they're saying, but it just takes time to put this stuff together. And in the meantime, we do have the OptumServe sites. That's probably your best bet in terms of efficiency, just sending patients over there. But if they're not able to get into OptumServe, then you should feel confident in, in walking them through this decision-making uh, and getting them started on Paxlovid. Um, it's really not that hard to do. All right, in terms of vaccines and boosters, um, I am working on an advisory, which some of you have requested, uh, permitting a second booster for healthcare workers, regardless of age. So remember the second booster right now, the way that the FDA and the CDC language have it, you have to be over age 50 or quote unquote immunocompromised. They really don't make a um, special um, a clause in there for people that are at higher risk, such as essential workers or those of us that are working in the front lines of healthcare uh, who are just seeing these patients all the time. Uh, I personally think that's wrong. You know, I really think that we need to protect our healthcare workers who are very short here in the Central Valley. Uh, not in terms of height, but in terms of how many of us there are, um, we, we really need to protect ourselves. And so I'm actually going to put out an advisory that permits pharmacists and vaccinating clinics to go ahead and give a second booster to people in the healthcare profession. Um, I, I, feel, um, I feel comfortable doing that. I think that the safety speaks for itself. And it's not a mandate. It's, it's no one's going to push you to do it or require you to do it. But for those of you who, who want to have a second booster and yet you're not uh, age 50 uh, yet, then, um, then, then basically this, this seems to be a good step uh, to allow the pharmacy to feel good doing that without, um, without thinking that they have to break any rules, et cetera. Okay. Um, Johnson & Johnson, remember this vaccine is now restricted even more as of May 5th. Uh, basically, the FDA says only use this vaccine if the patient does not qualify because of allergies or some other, some other issue to the mRNA vaccines. And I guess you could throw personal belief in there as well, um, because we know some people have some you know, uh, personal beliefs against mRNA vaccines. Uh, but nonetheless, 
the Johnson and Johnson is, is really uh, considered a second line in every sense of that word, just because of the clotting risk and also because of lower efficacy against uh, the COVID infection compared to the mRNA vaccines. So just keep that in mind. Um, it, it's still around. We still have some in our IZ division, but we're only using it for those who do not get the mRNA vaccine. Uh, the mRNA vaccines are just superior. They're still great products, despite all these variants that are coming out, and they're still going to protect your patient. So those should be the first line of vaccines. All right, any questions so far? Let's in the chat to see if there's any questions about what we've covered so far. Uh, Gil says, we're seeing more patients positive for COVID this week. Yes, and I bet you're seeing more staff out as well. So staffing shortages, related to COVID infections are happening the, all up and down the state, unfortunately. Uh, and so just tell your staff to be careful. You know, use those N95 masks, not just the surgical masks, and be very careful in their personal lives because this stuff is going around. Uh, we know that it's going around and it's really going to impact your operations if you have a lot of staff that are out sick. Where is my closest resource in Readly? Um, so uh, that, is something that you can look on our on our treatment locator, um, and maybe Sim can drop that in the chat. But basically, there's a really nice treatment locator that will give you the testing and the treatment sites, um, and we can find you the closest Optum Serve site to you in Readly. Um, I believe there's one in Sanger, but I could double check that. Uh, but we can definitely let you know um, where to go if you're in Readly. And then Lance is asking. Uh, what do you attribute the reports of increased symptoms uh, after being given Paxlovid? So yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know if it's an increase in symptoms or just a persistence or perhaps a recurrence, but they but they do um, they they are covering this in the media, and I think there's research being done. I was just reading about Dr. Bob Wachter at UCSF uh, talking about this. Uh, remember that in the original research studies, about one to two percent of people that got Paxlovid ended up having persistent or recurrent symptoms. So even in the original trials, there was that very small number of people who basically had, I don't know, even know what you would call that, maybe breakthrough symptoms. Um, and, and so that's always been there. The real win with Paxlovid is keeping people out of the hospital. And they keep reiterating that, that it's really not supposed to just make COVID go away with a snap of a finger. It's a five-day course of medication, and you may still have symptoms on day six or seven after you finish that medication, but you're going to be a heck of a lot better, and you're going to stay out of the hospital. Uh, and they back that up with, with lots of good data showing 89% protection uh, against hospitalization, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of where Paxlovid, um, I think, lands, is that some people are going to have breakthrough symptoms or persistent symptoms. Some people may even have recurrent symptoms, which is a little scary because now we're hearing about reports that, you know, they test positive, they start Paxlovid, then they test negative, all good. And then for whatever reason, they get symptoms again, then they test again, and then they test positive. So it's positive, negative, positive in terms of the testing which is never, which is always a headache to try to interpret. Like what happened, you know, was the second test that was negative done properly? Uh, did the body just decide to restart and, and reactivate the viral shedding for whatever reason? Is the, is the new virus that's being shed even viable? Is it even gonna be contagious? There's a lot of questions about that, but it is described in a very small minority of patients. Um, it may be higher than 2%, but you know, it's not going to be overwhelming. And I don't think anyone is worried that this is going to kill Paxlovid as a really good treatment uh, for us to be using right now. So it's something that's being watched. Um, some people are actually saying that th those patients should actually get 10 days of Paxlovid, not five days of Paxlovid, that perhaps it's basically just you know, inhibiting the viral replication and therefore taking care of some of the symptoms, but it's not totally eliminating the infection with just a five-day course. And so therefore some people are advocating for a 10 day course of Paxlovid. That's pretty controversial. You know, that, that's really not ready for prime time as it were, um, even though it's out there, CDC, FDA and Fauci are not ready to kind of go there with, with um, making the recommendation for 10 days of Paxlovid until more data comes in. But I think that that's certainly an alternative that would be off off label that you may wanna consider for high risk patients. You know, I think for people that are just symptomatic or testing positive with antigen tests, 
I just got a text message from one of my colleagues that had this going on. And I have to tell them, look, an antigen test that's positive right now in today's era means that you're still symptomatic and contagious. So you've got to stay home until your antigen test is negative. Or if you're asymptomatic, stop testing yourself. That's the other option. But if you are symptomatic or you're testing yourself and you come back positive with an antigen test, you, you know, I can't do anything besides tell you to stay home until that test is negative. And it's really up to you if you want to take 10 days of Paxlovid or get a prescriber to give you another, you know, another treatment course, uh, which again is not wrong. It's just not been proven. There's no randomized controlled trials that were done that show, you know, 10 days is you know, is the right thing to do, or a second course of Paxlovid is the right thing to do. So it's quite confusing for me as well, but know that you're not alone. Uh, know that this is being described and it's something that um, will hopefully, we'll have some better answers than what I'm just giving you right now. And then do we have an ETA for newer versions of boosters? I really don't know. I'm hoping by this fall, because I imagine that by this fall, we will have radically different variants. Um, these variants just seem to be coming every four to six weeks now. Uh, so I imagine that, you know, the pharmaceutical companies are reportedly working on newer versions of boosters, uh, but I don't think that they're going to be ready before this fall, uh, possibly this winter. Um, I think that that's kind of where we're going with that. So yeah, Portia, just to go back, um, the healthcare workers, I'm going to send out an advisory permitting, not recommending or requiring, but permitting healthcare workers who want a second booster uh, to go ahead and get one. Uh, and, and hopefully they can show that memo to the pharmacy. Uh, and then the pharmacist can honor that and say it's coming from the health department and we'll go ahead and give you a second booster. Or if you yourself have a vaccination um, program, you can use that to justify doing a second booster for healthcare workers who don't otherwise qualify for one right now. All right, great questions. Okay, now let's talk about something non-COVID, uh, which is that there is a shortage of baby formula. And this shortage of baby formula is, is actually affecting a lot of families. Uh, our colleagues at Valley Children's Healthcare, uh, Dr. Haley Nelson uh, and the communications team there, have put together just a fantastic one pager in English and Spanish about this situation. Uh, and then I got some other language off some national websites. Poison Control is work, you know, working on this as well. The issue is, you know, what's a family going to do if there's no formula on the shelf? They're basically going to stretch whatever baby formula they have by diluting it out or making their own homemade formula. And none of those is really that safe. You know, you can really mess up a baby's electrolytes. You can put them into hyponatremia, hypoglycemia, um, and basically just lead to a lot of complications if you start futzing around with the formulas that are professionally made and FDA approved for the purpose of sustaining the nutrition of the baby. But that's exactly the risk here. Some people are thinking, oh, well, if I just use something vegan or vegetarian based like almond milk or soy milk, uh, that that will be safe. And none of that is true. So basically, we're just trying to get good information out to say, you know, we want you to, we want you to be able to feed your baby. Um, there's lots of stores that do have formula available and they are limiting and rationing how much each person can buy so that they can really distribute it as, as equitably as possible. Um, there's websites that people can go to and the FDA is working with uh, the formula manufacturers to expedite more manufacturing, although they say it's still going to be four to six weeks before this formula shortage resolves. Um, so, you know, just get the message out. If you have parents that are frantic and calling you, then we will share this formula shortage guidance that Valley Children's has very generously shared. Uh, it's actually on their, on their social media, on their websites, et cetera, as well. So um, you can look at that. Uh, this little bottom box is interesting. You know, can I use cow's milk in place of infant formula? Well, whole cow's milk does not replace infant formula, especially for kids under the age of 12 months. However, you can use it for 24 to 48 hours. If the child is 10 to 12 months or older, um, they can also start to receive solid foods at that point. So, you know, for, for babies that are a little bit older, 
uh, like 10 to 12 months or older, they can just get more of their nutrition from solid foods as opposed to formula and don't exceed more than 24 ounces of cow's milk per day uh, and uh, provide a complete multivitamin with iron and other essential nutrients by using some of these products that they've recommended. So I thought that that was really good um, help. Uh, and uh, hopefully this gives people some direction about what to do. And, uh, you know, we're ready to help you. Um, our local WIC is actually another great resource uh, for those who are WIC participants, because WIC actually contracts separately to get their own supplies of infant formula. Uh, and they're not using companies in California that um, are affected by this shortage. So um, you relatively speaking, California is not as bad off as some of the other states um, that are really hard hit, but we understand that parents are, are definitely panicking about this. And so we wanna make more information available and hear people's concerns. And I'll open it up to any other suggestions or, or words of wisdom from our community uh, if they've been dealing with these or what conversations they've been having with parents. And yes, that is whole milk lamps. It turns out there's a lot of adults with GI issues um, and, uh, and, and post-surgical dietary uh, restrictions that actually rely on baby formula. So this, this might affect some adult patients as well. It's not just young infants, uh, but you know that just adds to the burden of people that we worry about whenever situations like this happen. It's kind of absurd. There's only like three or four manufacturers for like all of the baby formula in America. And so when you, you imagine when one of those manufacturers goes offline, the reason that it went offline was because of a voluntary recall and the voluntary recall followed two fatalities related to uh, bacterial sepsis. And so they basically um, tra tracked it back to their plant somewhere in the Midwest. And then that factory is basically just getting a thorough review by the FDA to make sure that all of that bacterial contamination is no longer there. Uh, and that's why it's taking so long. Uh, and then on top of that, you know, the pandemic just resulting in, in workforce shortages and lots of supply line disruptions. Uh, it, it's a really fragile system, unfortunately, um, and, um, and, and just a lesson learned for, you know, how, to, how not to plan uh, the food system. Uh, so for what it's worth, hopefully this will lead to a stronger and more robust supply line for this product and for really all food products. People are saying that the whole food system just needs to be overhauled because this could happen with a number of different, uh, you know, a number of different food products. And there's just, you know, single fail points in our food industry that we really have to think about. So hopefully this will be a wake up call and a larger conversation. But nonetheless, for the crisis of the week being the baby formula, hopefully this is the resource that you need to kind of get your parent, get your patients and their parents through this acute crisis. Let me keep going here. All right, so just remember that naloxone distribution, there's a, a state grant that's open. Um, I'm gonna keep reminding you about naloxone and our opioid epidemic because it is really just giving us so many signals that we need to be doing more. Um, in fact, I'm going to dedicate a whole hour of these talks. So you're gonna hear me talk at you for a whole hour about opioids. Uh, sometime in the next couple of months. Uh, it might actually be next month. Uh, and I guarantee you, you'll get your X waiver after we're done talking. Uh, so for those of you who are prescribers on this call, you really should get your X waiver. Uh, that's gonna be one of our key interventions to get us out of this epidemic of opioid deaths and fentanyl deaths. And I'll explain more about what that means, but just keep in mind that that's, that's a really key intervention that we're not doing enough is getting our prescribers X waiver to be able to provide medication assisted treatment, also known as buprenorphine or suboxone. Uh, remember, we also have money here at the health department for um, doing STD work. So STD testing, um, we can provide local grants uh, because we happen to have leftover money that we have to get spent in the next couple of months. So please reach out to us if you wanna craft a project together, we would love to talk with you. Uh, it's going to be a short timeline, but hey, it's free money and we don't want to send it back to the state. So we really hope that some of you can benefit from uh, doing this because we know that you serve a lot of populations that are vulnerable to STDs. All right, speaking of STDs, or maybe not, uh, here's a little pop quiz. 
Does anybody know what this picture is? Uh, what kind of disease causes these lesions? And please unmute yourselves if you know. Um, and PG-13 responses only, please. I'll give you a hint. There's an outbreak that's very concerning in the United Kingdom and they've just discovered a case in Massachusetts. And I think this is probably a picture from that case. Is it much? Okay, so I said syphilis. Okay, that's a good, that's a good thought. This is not syphilis, but I like that you're thinking about STD. Is it is it monkeypox? It's monkeypox, actually, yes. And uh, monkeypox is a very interesting disease. I I am learning more about it all the time. But monkeypox um, was originally described in monkeys doesn't necessarily come from monkeys, although it can, but it was described in monkeys at a research facility who probably got it from rodents. So maybe it should be called rodent pox. But nonetheless, um, this is basically another zoonotic illness, kind of like COVID, which has jumped into the human species multiple times and is now causing a cluster, I wouldn't even call it an epidemic, although you can, a cluster of cases in the UK. Now, what's frustrating about this cluster is Usually whenever you have a monkeypox case, it's because it's someone typically from Sub-Saharan Africa who had a very good story. You know, they live in that area, they were bitten by an animal, maybe they consumed meat from an animal that um, is known to have um, monkeypox circulating. There's usually a direct connection, so the contact tracing is a no-brainer. Now the UK cases, these people have never traveled, they don't know anyone else who has this disease, they just came down with monkeypox out of the blue, which makes people super worried that it's actually circulating silently among the community and that there's a large population that's already infected with monkeypox and kind of spreading it silently. And now it's being found in the UK, I think in Spain and Portugal, and the first case occurred in Massachusetts that was reported earlier this week. And that case in Massachusetts, again, had no history of travel and the contact tracing does not give any answers. So it's like, where did that person get it from? That's why this is making the headlines and that's why I included it here is that this is just another one of those interesting diseases that makes life fun at the health department because this is something that we're tracking and tracing. Now, the authorities have very reassuredly said, there's no cause for alarm. There's no way this will lead to a pandemic. Don't worry about it. We've got it under control. And you know that they're right every time they say that. So obviously there's nothing to worry about here. Um, I, I say that in jest, obviously, uh, they said all the same stuff about COVID whenever it first came out. Uh, but you know, this is a totally different way of transmission. They're saying that this is not necessarily a, an aerosol borne illness. It might, be, it might be transmitted through respiratory droplets, but it's most frequently transmitted through actual contact with the fluids of an infected animal or patient, um, such as saliva, uh, sexual contact, or if these blisters start to break open, then, then that blister fluid could be very contagious and pass it on to the next person. So it's probably not going to take off with the same velocity that, um, for example, COVID did. But it is something interesting to think about and, and read about. Uh, and the fact that there's silent transmission gives it kind of that mysterious edge that makes people very interested in figuring out more about what's going on. Anyway, I'll send you, uh, whenever I send out the presentation, I'll send you some links to monkeypox, which is the answer here. This could easily be gonorrhea. I mean, you know, this is basically disseminated gonorrhea causes gray pustules like this. Uh, maybe not with the red ring as much, but definitely, you know, uh, has that same look. Uh, and so this person would need a workup for STDs uh, as well as, as monkeypox, which basically um, was described only after they got rid of smallpox. So this really looks like smallpox in some respects, and people thought it was smallpox, but then after smallpox um, inoculation, and vaccination was so successful that we actually eradicated it from the human species. They started to see these cases, and then they went back in time and, and realized that there were probably a bunch of monkeypox cases that was misdiagnosed as smallpox because they look alike. I think the viruses are actually pretty similar. And so that's kind of another interesting dimension to this is that, you know, for what it's worth, this might be a distant cousin of smallpox and it's still around and circulating. Uh, Dr. Mitchell asked a good question. Does the department provide any education for the community about Narcan use and distribution? 
Um, so yes and no. I mean, Dr. Mitchell, the, the Narcan boxes that we give out uh, actually have the education pretty much right on there. Like, hey, if the person's not breathing, then give them Narcan and call 911. So in that sense, we do do a very brief, you know, teaching session, as it were, for everyone who comes by and gets a box, at least at my hospital we do. We also have the same boxes of Narcan available at the health department. Um, beyond that, we do kind of one-off presentations for groups. Uh, you know, my substance use team at the hospital has been great. They do a lot of like uh, education in the community. Believe it or not, in 2022, we're at a point where I actually did a training for high school students and we distributed Narcan to high school students. Uh, and, and, and they wanted it. They basically were like, thank you, because we're so scared of fentanyl. And the parents were very grateful that we did that. But, but basically, that's kind of where we are, is we're just at a point where we need to do broad community education related to Narcan. Uh, and we don't have a formal structure of doing that through the health department. But um, there's a couple of different agencies that I work with. One is the Central Valley Opioid Safety Coalition, which has representatives from the health department, but it's actually operated out of um, Fresno Madera Medical Society. And they do kind of the lion's share of the Narcan training in this community. Uh, I'm happy to introduce you to them if you want to get involved with that. Uh, and then the bridge program, the California Bridge Network does a lot of you know, online training, webinars, and in-person training just through all of the bridge sites. Uh, and we have several bridge sites here in Fresno County. Uh, I actually oversee the one at CRMC. Uh, and we're helping launch one at Clovis as well. There's several other hospitals that are bridge sites too, and we're trying to encourage them to do Narcan distribution as well. So those are some of the inroads that we're making, um, but we have more work to do and we need to collaborate more with our partners at Behavior Health to make sure that um, everyone who needs Narcan has Narcan. And not only do they have Narcan in their hand, but they know how to use it. So that education piece is super critical as well. Great questions. All right, are there any other announcements? Um, I'm looking for my friend, Chris. Um, I think that's your iPhone, Chris. So um, Chris and Dr. Sadler is on as well. Hi, Dr. Sadler. Uh, just a quick reminder that uh, we are always short with blood donors. So whatever you can do to help facilitate blood donation, uh, especially typo negative, that will help our partners at the Central California Blood Center, uh, which, which really service many different counties here in Central California uh, and really keep our hospitals operating and keep everything going with um, life-saving surgeries and interventions. Uh, and, and we need to return the favor by helping them get blood donors. So please spread the word, consider donating yourself uh, or host a blood drive. That would be lovely to have your staff be able to uh, just go down during their lunch hour and donate blood uh, and help the Central California Blood Center. And I don't know if Chris or, or, or Dr. Sadler, if you want to add to those comments. Hey, thanks, Dr. Bora. This is Chris. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm outdoors, so I apologize if it's a little windy. But um, yeah, thank you. The blood supply is in somewhat better shape than a few months ago, uh, but we're still uh, in in dire need of O negative, type O negative blood. And the other announcement is that we just opened our new fixed site. Uh, we had our grand opening this morning in Clovis. And so we now have a fixed site in Clovis. It's in the, um, the Target Shopping Center at Willow and Herndon. And so oh, great. anyone who lives out in that area or works in that area can now uh, swing by during lunch break and donate blood. So uh, thanks again for mentioning the important need for blood, Dr. Bora. Great, and you can go grab a drink at the Mad Duck while you're at it. I think it's yeah. at the shopping center. Pint for pint. <laughs> that's fantastic, that, that's great. Well, congratulations on opening that site. Uh, I hope that that's a, a real success. I'm sure it will be. And uh, we look forward to supporting you. Thank you. Sure. Anything else? Lance, did you want to make a comment or have a question? Uh, I think my mic works. Okay. My question is, I wrote in the chat too, are there restrictions? Because I heard something about restrictions 
status post COVID infection or vaccination, like a waiting period? Is that is that fake or it's so hard to tell anymore, Dr. Boyer? There's so much fake news out there. Well, yeah, I, I definitely agree with you there. Um, really, the restrictions are based on symptoms uh, for the infection part. Um, and really, as long as someone is symptomatic, you know, we, we say on average, it takes about 10 days. And so that's where they set the, that's kind of where they set the limit is to say, you know, most people will get better and be asymptomatic by day 10. But remember, there's always exceptions and these new variants keep throwing us curveballs. So that may not exactly apply to every single person. And you really have to ask yourself if you're still symptomatic, you know, are you still contagious? And if you are, you may have to be restricted for longer than 10 days. Uh, in the early days of the pandemic, we really were thinking about immunocompromised patients as having to take longer to kind of fight the infection. And so we actually pushed out that 10 day isolation period to 21 days. That's still a good rule of thumb, you know, despite the fact that obviously immunocompromised patients, we want them to have the EvuShield antibody, we want them to have the pills or the, the monoclonal antibodies after they get sick and therefore get, get back to their normal activities as soon as possible. So that may be a lot shorter than 21 days, but that's just an indication that if some people have an immune system that takes longer to fight this infection, they may be symptomatic for longer than 10 days. So I would say that that would be more of a, of a personal, you know, a personalized plan of care um, for those types of restrictions. Um, some people are saying, just wear a mask, you know, your first week after being back, just wear a mask, J just, you know, regardless of whether you're symptomatic, asymptomatic, you know, you're testing, you're not testing, just come back to work with a mask for seven days. And I think that's a good policy too, honestly, because that will probably help prevent a lot of these questions that we're having about, am I still contagious? Am I still shedding? Am I this? Am I that? Obviously in healthcare, we all have to wear a mask. You've got one on your chin right now. Um, mm -hmm. You're, you, whenever you go out into the public, um, into the care areas, you're going to have to put it right back on. So in healthcare, we're already wearing a mask all the time. So it may not apply to us in our clinical duties, but whenever it comes to our personal lives, going out grocery shopping, you know, having social errands, et cetera, that's where the masking is really going to tip us in the right balance. And so think about masking for higher risk situations, higher risk patients, and higher risk um, uh, interactions like indoors with high crowds and stuff like that. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear, uh, Dr. Borer. My question really is, is, is there a restriction on giving blood after an infection? So it's about oh, yeah. the blood. Um, so I know that it said something about giving blood and not being able to do it after you've been infected. I know you should wait till you're asymptomatic to do that unless you're giving for antibody use, right? But I was just curious because we've heard some stuff and I think that's caused a little bit of this lag after an infection, people aren't rushing out to give blood and oh, you know, that's right. what I'm talking about. Um, maybe Dr. Sadler's on the line can, uh, can answer that one. Dr. Sadler? Yeah, hi, uh, hi everyone. Uh, you know, really it, it's gotten to the point where, you know, if you've, if you've uh, recovered from your, from your infection, you're no longer symptomatic, uh, and you're, you know, you're back to your normal activities, uh, and that's usually going to take what, what I think we're looking at here is seven to 10 days or, or so, then, um, then you're fine. You're, you would be eligible as a blood donor, uh, to come back as long as you're, we're, we're looking for people that are well and healthy, uh, uh, no matter what, that's always the bottom line too. So, we still have a blood mobile if I set up a drive or do you guys just show up with a truck or how does that work? Because we're way out here pretty far, but I might be able to set one up for all my employees and and maybe the people live in the apartments here, too, because a lot yeah. of them had COVID. I don't know if you guys are still harvesting antibodies off that or what you're doing with it, but yeah. we haven't ran a blood drive here since I've been here. So, oh, that's great. Uh, thank you. Let's um, let us have maybe Dr. Vora can uh, make sure I have your contact information um and then we'll reach out to you uh, with our marketing and recruitment people will reach out to you that would be awesome and let that be a challenge to everybody else don't let lance be the only hero today but thank you lance 
think we need more blood drives for sure. So I love seeing the blood mobile, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the mobile um, donation site uh, out at our hospitals. Uh, you've actually come out to the health department and set up downstairs. So mm -hmm. we know that you've got a team that's ready to go at a moment's notice and, and we hope we can help facilitate these blood drives. Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I don't like to be the only guy talking, Dr. Boer, but I also heard that the CDC in a, in a, in a call log that I got, the CDC saying that we're, we may be able to eliminate masks in non-patient care areas, except for CDPH isn't behind that. Is that where we're sitting right now? And and will that yeah, change? Or? Uh, you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard time to even broach that topic right now uh, because the numbers are going in the wrong direction. So things are gonna have to get real quiet again and stay quiet for a long time before CDPH feels comfortable. I mean, I think you're actually gonna see LA Institute a mass mandate uh, probably in the next week or so. They're threatening. Uh, they're saying, you know, if their case positivity goes over 10%, they're going to institute an indoor mass mandate. I mean, that's already on the books. So you, you might see that being invoked. Um, and if LA does it, then, then basically that, that has a domino effect on a lot of different dynamics in the state. Um, so, you know, for now, um, it, it's going to be hard for the general public to be under a mask mandate. And so for healthcare to then not be under a mask mandate just doesn't make sense. So I think for now, we're gonna be stuck with the masks. And I think that's the right, that, honestly, that's the right policy right now. Uh, as inconvenient as it is, um, I really think that that does protect people and does help keep our workforce healthy. And so I support masking and healthcare. Um, I, I don't know when that will ever change. Um, I think, you know, like I said, we're probably gonna have these perturbations, uh, this turbulence. Uh, hopefully it'll even out over time and, and hopefully it won't um, cause massive surges and disruptions the way that the first few did but I'm sure we're gonna have ups and downs and ebbs and flows. And so it's, it's going to take you know, a lot more data for people to feel comfortable uh, allowing non-masking in healthcare areas. And at the same time, I wish people would invent more comfortable masks that worked well. You know, I think that, that's, that, that's an innovation that still needs to be coming. You know, is we need to make N95s that don't feel like they're choking you off. Um, we need to just innovate in that space and just invent better devices for ourselves. Um, so hopefully that'll come along as well. So not only can we stay protected, but we can also stay comfortable because it's really hard to wear an N95 for eight hours at a time. I get that. Um, but right now that's kind of what we have to do to stay fully protected. Remember, ventilation is really coming up as another strategy. Um, we don't talk a lot about ventilation on the healthcare side, but it's something that like um, the facilities folks and really environmental health folks are very familiar with all the different tools that you can use to, to do ventilation. Um, you know, I'll, I'll probably do a deeper dive into this, um, especially during wildfire season, because ventilation not only helps with COVID, but it also helps protect our patients and keep them healthier from the particulate matter and all of the other pollution that seems to come into the buildings during wildfire season. Um, and there's a lot that can be done. You know, there's for those that can afford it, there's actually great HEPA filter fans and things like that that you can set up. And that actually is supposed to really decrease the number of COVID particles that are floating around indoor spaces. Um, and, and for those that can't afford those, there's actually really cool, cheaper versions that you can make yourself just with uh, air conditioning filters. So I actually, this is on my to-do list, so let me grab it. Um, this is my, this is on my honeydew list is changing out the air conditioning filters in my house. And so um, basically you can hook these up to box fans uh, and create uh, very effective filters um, that can actually work for particulate matter as well as for COVID. And, and uh, in a future session, I'll share some really cool designs and models uh, that I'm just exploring for some of the climate health work that we're doing. 
but you can actually teach your patients to create these on their own with just box fans, uh, which are a lot more affordable. And uh, we really need to be a little bit more savvy about how to keep our patients um, better ventilated uh, at their home, in their workplaces, and to keep our staff safer with ventilation strategies. So in addition to the masking and the PPE, just remember that that's another layer of protection. And if that gets really good, then I think then the calculation for masking changes a little bit, right? Is if you can prove that the ventilation that you're using is really good enough to protect people, I think then, then the authorities will feel more comfortable uh, allowing you to take the mask off in certain situations. That's just my take on it. That's good to know. Uh, Lance is sharing something about hydroxyl generators. I'm not sure exactly what those are. Um, I don't know if those use hydrogen peroxide or there's a lot of technology here. There's UV light, there's you know chemical-based disinfectants. Um, so there, there's a lot to know. I, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to give the illusion that I'm a, an expert on this, but I just know that you know indoor ventilation needs to advance and will advance as a result of this pandemic. And that's probably good for all of us for, you know, just for our own health. All right, well, it looks like we um, have about five to seven more minutes left. And um, if there's no other comments or questions, we can go ahead and adjourn. Uh, hopefully everyone's comfortable with the every two weeks meeting. We can certainly do more or less often if it's desired. Uh, what we really want to do though is, is, is try to diversify and give you information not related to COVID because we know that, you know, there's a lot of other stuff besides COVID that we need to be talking about. So we want to hear your ideas and we really want to hear from you if you're an expert and have a lecture or a presentation that you want to give. Even if it's a five minute presentation, uh, we really want to know you know, um, and, and hear from our medical community about what they're passionate about, what they're experts in, and, and what, uh, you know, their colleagues need to know about the work that they do. So for some of you, I'll, I'll, tap, I'll tap you, but for others, um, please feel free to uh, come out of the woodwork and, and really um, reach out to us and, and let us know if you want to do some presentations on this forum, because I really learn every time from, from those, and I hope that you all do as well. Otherwise, stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you for all that you do. I think we'll go ahead and adjourn. I'll email you about the hepatitis cases, Lance. Um, the, the short answer is there's not a, a, a huge update. Um, it's still being explored. So I don't really have any, any good new information. I just know that the number of cases is going up as this investigation kind of broadens. So that's the short answer to your question about hepatitis in kids. All right, thanks everyone. Take care. I'll send out the slides in a little bit. Bye. Thank you.